Good afternoon. My name is uh, Adam Rechkin, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Western Australia in the Graduate School of Education. And I'm working on a project about knowledge production practices of sociology PhD students with uh, Associate Professor Edgar Burns from the University of Waikato in New Zealand. There are three main components uh, in our project. Uh, we are focusing on knowledge production practices of sociology PhD students during uh, their enrollment. And uh, we are also interested in gender differences in their knowledge production practices. Uh, second, we are interested in impacts on sociology of universities changes. So for instance, what's the impact of the PBRF or the ERI on the discipline in Australia and in New Zealand. And uh, also we are interested in uh, methodological innovations, how to conduct a study which investigates uh, knowledge production uh, practices of uh, sociology PhD students. And uh, there are uh, lots of uh, methodological questions that, that uh, we needed that we had to answer during our research. So for instance, how do you locate uh, and identify sociology PhD theses? How do you identify what counts as a referred research outputs? And uh, how do you uh, identify which outputs students publish, publish during candidacy and which were published after? Now, in terms of results from our project so far, we published uh, two productivity studies, one productivity study on New Zealand and the other productivity study on the group of eight uh, Australian uh, universities. And uh, our third paper is uh, that has been recently published in the Australian Universities Review is about uh, um, knowledge production practices of sociology PhDs and their contribution to the academy. And we also discuss in this article the impact of the excellence in research in Australia uh, exercise on the discipline of uh, sociology in uh, Australia. Now, in terms of uh, the rationale or why it is important to uh, do research about the uh, knowledge production practices of sociology uh, PhD students, uh, there are two main arguments that, that can be mounted. Uh, first argument is uh, related to academic uh, careers. Uh, academic labor market is undergoing uh, rapid changes. Uh, there are issues of demand and supply. Uh, Rob uh, Warren from the United States just wrote an article uh, about, about this and uh, he had identified that, for instance, in the US, uh, those top 25 sociology departments are producing uh, much more PhDs than, than 20 years ago. And uh, there is a similar issue uh, here in Australia. So there is a very high competition on the academic labor market. And one could argue that the nature of PhD is changing as well. It's, it's not just the PhD itself, but it's PhD and refereed outputs. And, and those refereed outputs get uh, a central importance for those PhD students who want to pursue uh, an academic or research career. So, so well-placed referred outputs are becoming increasingly important for PhD completers who want to pursue a career in the academy, uh, who want to get into postdocs or who want to uh, get uh, entry-level academic positions. But also another argument could be could be mounted. Uh, and it's uh, about uh, knowledge accumulation and knowledge creation within individual uh, disciplines. And uh, uh, it is widely recognized that, that PhD research uh, is a major source of new knowledge production in universities, yet uh, the results of PhD research in social sciences, uh, in education and in other disciplines are not often published. And, and because of that, there are dif diminished opportunities for, uh, for professional dialogue or knowledge building that uh, could take a particular discipline or particular field forward. Now, uh, in terms of uh, those, uh, uh, in terms of the context of our work, our work is situated in a rapidly changing uh, 
uh, globalized higher education sector and uh, and universities became global businesses which which draw on international markets for students prestige and knowledge and and the introduction of uh, of global university rankings uh, has i think intensified the competition between uh, universities for prestige and, and status and uh, and all those major changes have uh, redefined which forms of academic labor are uh, valued and, and refereed outputs have uh, been reprioritized in terms of academic labor as, uh, as gold standard. And, and they are important for, for universities competing for world-class status in this globalized unified higher education sector, but they are also important, as, as I mentioned previously, for PhD students, but, but also for, for academics, for individual departments, and for, for individual disciplines and, and for, for their survival in this uh, increasingly vocationally oriented uh, university, corporate university. In terms of uh, our studies, I mentioned that we did uh, two productivity studies and uh, on the right, you can see here uh, two uh, pie charts. First pie chart is on all, all Australian, Australian sociology PhD completions, and the second one is on sociology uh, PhD completions in New Zealand. You can see that uh, sociology in Austra Australasia is highly feminized. However, when you, when you look at uh, various different statistics on the uh, academic labor market, then uh, you, you can still see that, that uh, there are more men than women at, uh, uh, posi at positions above level C, above senior lecturer. And so there are still gender differences in terms of career progression. And from our perspective, it is very important to have a look at what's happening at the PhD level in terms of knowledge production practices. Uh, because uh, if you apply uh, various different theories, um, of let's say cumulative advantage and disadvantage, you can you can see that those small differences in in output production can actually grow over time into larger career defining sort of differences. This slide segues between what Adam's just shown you about gender and the next slide, which will go a little bit more about the production of outputs during PhDs. So down the left-hand side, you can see from zero up to nine, increasing number of outputs, individuals in our sample produced while they were doing their PhD. It's pretty amazing, isn't it, when you get up to seven, eight or nine. And those people had special backgrounds that helped them to do that. Um, but you can see the proportions across the bottom um, of men and women, two thirds, one third. So there's a surprising similarity in the productivity of men and women, even though um, that takes into account the different ratios that we've got a more uh, feminized um, discipline than ones like politics and philosophy, which are very masculinized disciplines. So there's a very big change going on in sociology PhD publishing traditions, given we sit between the monograph oriented history and English literature kind of disciplines on the one hand, and between the STEM sciences and psychology, which are very refereed article kind of PhD programs that they run. We've tended to be more towards the monograph, the single volume thesis, and we're getting a lot of pressure to change that. And some of you will think that's a good thing as students and as supervisors, and some of you will think that's a bad thing as students or supervisors. There's implications, but what we're trying to do in this presentation is give you some of the facts that have come up in our articles we've published, and we've got more coming out on bigger um, data sets so we can confirm or extend our results. So the final part of this presentation, we just want to point to you three patterns. Um, and the first of them is super producers. Can I check with you, Adam, how we're we going for time? Uh, we still have seven minutes. Right, so we, we're going okay. So these three patterns are quite interesting and we've come up with names for them um, to see if we can't uh, help ourselves to think what, what is going on here. And the first of these comes off our previous slide and we, for, for analysis purposes, decided to divide all those 
did a person produce zero or one or two or three, we said to ourselves, there's quite a big group producing none, almost half of the student cohort. Then there's a, quite, quite a group who produce um, one to three. That's almost another half. Um, so a bit under half for both of those. Um, and that's pretty busy when you're doing a PhD, that you're ticking up a chapter or some part of what you're doing and you're organizing that, working with your supervisor in many cases and turning that into an article. And you don't get success first time, so that's pretty commendable. And then we have this category of about, about over 10% of the students produce nearly half of the actual outputs by themselves. So we've called them super producers to try and get at some people with more social capital, more educational capital background are somehow able to produce that. That has all sorts of implications that we've talked about amongst ourselves, and you might have ideas that you think what that means. So let's look at our second pattern. Again, we've picked up a, a cute phrase, this time from the advent of online shopping, when there might only be two copies of a book around the world, but with the internet, you can find those two copies. So here we've turned it around the other way and said, where do those students who publish during PhDs in sociology actually publish? What journals? And you see on the top left, the two big Australian journals, Journal of Sociology and Journal of Youth Studies, there's quite a few publications in them, 16 in JOS and 10 in JYS for this particular group of students. Um, but as you get along the bottom of this graph, one student will publish one article and no other student will publish in that journal again. So it's what we call a very long tail. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? We ask again, like we did before. And there's interpretations, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. It may mean we're contributing and have a very diverse and rich um, disciplinary set of interests, or it may, may mean that we haven't got the focus that some other disciplines have. And again, you can say, you can have an opinion whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. So that brings us to our third pattern um, that we just want to present to you coming off our data. And we're going, we're widening our data and extending it over time and doing other things with it, looking at in the future, we'll look at more about co-authoring. But this chart, Adam's term, the cake graphics, because they help us to see that clearly. Where are the sociology theses done? Well, down the bottom, the what the, the bottom of the ghetto is, of course, as you'd expect, sociology departments or sociology uh, interdisciplinary departments where sociology finds a home. But the, all the layers up above tell you that almost every other department or faculty in these universities, University of Queensland and University of Melbourne, have significant amounts of sociology helping them to get their pharmacy PhD done or their agronomy PhD done or their engineering degree done. Again, in this third pattern, the question arises, is this good or bad or so what? And you can see it as a good thing if you see that as a sociology helping um, the heavy lifting right across the university being a good university citizen. Or you could say there's a danger for sociology in that we're not going to get the recognition because that's an engineering degree or a pharmacy degree, and that might affect sociology's future in attracting students in and getting funding. So we've looked particularly at gender differences. We found those very interesting, but we're going to keep on widening that out in the future. But it's very important to recognize that the PhDs today, they're not the big hitters of lecturers and professors and researchers, but they are those people in 10 and 20 years time. So what they're struggling with or finding they need to do is very relevant for the future. And they come into, you come into if you're a PhD student, a publish or perish environment that the neoliberal has brought about. So making your peace with that, coping with that, winning in that or finding ways through that is an important part of your business as it is if you're a supervisor, how do you respond to that? How do you help your PhD students? We could talk a lot about our methodological innovations that Adam referred you to. We've had a lot of fun working out how to make consistent decisions about our methods. And we've come up with some new angles that I don't think have been tried before, as well as sometimes adopting ones from overseas literature. That could be a whole presentation in itself. So we won't go into that, but just to advise you that um, it's very live, what you might call a community of thinking around here. And if any of you want to um, challenge us or ask us questions or make comments, 
through emails. We're both on our university websites. We'd love to hear and converse further. So thank, thank you for your you. time today.